She says, it's a great pleasure to meet you, but would you buckle your seatbelt, please? And she moves back to the back of the plane and works her way up, and she comes back up to Mr. Ali and sees that he hasn't buckled his seatbelt. She says, Mr. Ali, sir, would you mind buckling your seatbelt so we can take off? Muhammad Ali takes a breath, looks up at her, and says, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> now, if Mr. Muhammad Ali told me anything, I would probably agree with him just straight out. And if I was a flight attendant, which I'd never been, I'd probably say, okay, that's cool. We can take off without your seatbelt. But this flight attendant, she had a job to do, and she had the tenacity to look right back at him and said, is that right? Well, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> I got two things to take away from that. Number one is pride. The sin of pride. And I can tell you, pride always works its way back into my life in one way or another. The other one is, I'm not Superman. I cannot be the answer to everything. I can't be something to everyone. And so, as a human, I gotta realize I don't have superhuman powers. None of us do. Because each of us are here really to reflect the one real superhero, Jesus Christ. Amen, can I get an amen? amen. Very good. After this weekend, we will all have the opportunity to choose whether we are going to reject or reflect the glory of God. Rejecting or reflecting the glory of God. I've added another little subtitle to my talk here. And I've really viewed the appointment with God is where the rubber meets the road. Just this past May, 2014, Ryan Hunter Ray won the Indianapolis 500. I know this is a little dark here. It looked really good on my laptop. But can you see what this is? Tire. 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 So it's the rubber meets the road. So this past May, Ryan Hunter Ray wins the Indianapolis 500. It was the first time an American had won it in eight years. And it was actually the second closest finish of the 105 year history of the Indianapolis 500. There's a lot that goes into the Indy. Anybody ever watch it? Even for a minute or two? I don't think the commercials are as good as the Super Bowl. But there's a lot that goes into the Indy 500. The car, the crew chief, the crew, the sponsors, the dollars, the drivers. However, for me, it really boils down to just two things, power and traction. Power and traction. And all the power that car has, all the traction and steering that car has, is where the rubber meets the road. Whether we admit it or not, where the rubber meets the road, in each of our relationships and walk with God, who is the creator of the universe, is completely defined by our prayer life and the time that we carve out to spend with him. Why pray? Last night, Pat Dooley spoke about God has a plan, giving us a purpose to pray. Closing last night, Darren spoke about being called, we're all called to greatness. But we need to identify and deal with what stands in the way. This morning, Jim's talk on called to Jesus talked about that friendship, that relationship with Jesus Christ. Who died on the cross for each of us in this room. And rose again so we all can experience it and have hope in eternal life. Our last talk of the morning was with Joe Blanco. And he shared, not only in his stories and his teaching, the power of the Holy Spirit. 
There are really three givens when we look at God. And it's really the Trinity. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Many of us pray to all three of them on a consistent basis. Some of us are drawn to God the Father and the fatherly image. Others constantly thank God, the Son, Jesus, who died, who lived, died, and rose again. And the Holy Spirit, whom we also seek counsel from and ask to intervene. Why pray? Because Jesus did. He went off to lonely places for days to pray to his Father. We pray to engage God in conversation with us. Seek direction. Seek forgiveness. Seek help. Seeking help from God the Father, Jesus himself, and the Holy Spirit. We ask God questions. Lord, why, what are you trying to teach me? Or one of my favorites is, Lord, what do you want me to do today? We intercede in prayer for others, for health issues, relationships, healing, counsel and direction. We study and apply the Holy Scriptures to our lives. We need to learn and know more of God's Word so we can build an intimate friendship with Jesus and learn how he wants to speak to us. There are lots of reasons why we don't pray. I spoke about pride already. So pride is one of three key reasons why we don't pr open up in our communication and set a prayer time with God. The other one is fear. I can tell you personally, I was afraid God would tell me something that I didn't want to do. Anybody relate to that? Another one is hurry. This is the one that escapes most of us. The hurry and busyness of life. Anybody know what a Snapchat is? So kids are big in Snapchats. Basically it's a five second something that you send from one phone to another phone. Some of us have reduced our prayer life to Snapchats in hoping to get God's attention and intervention in our life. In John 17, 3, Jesus says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you. The only true God, Jesus Christ, is the best man. Prayer is essential for us to come to know God. Our relationship with Jesus is the doorway to our relationship with God. During the Last Supper, the Apostle Thomas asked Jesus, So how can we know the way? In John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except me. Brothers, Jesus said He is the way, and that He is the only way to God the Father. Some people argue that this way is too narrow. I beg to differ. In reality, it is as wide enough for the whole world to pass. We just have to choose that Jesus is the way. How many of you have had at least one great friendship? Raise a hand because we want to feel sorry for the rest of you. <clears throat> Come on, there you go. So all of you have had one great friendship. What kind of communication did that take to develop that great friendship? If we are to live in Christ and He in us, experiencing His presence in us, we must come to a new level of intimacy with Him and with our Father. Relationships don't grow without ongoing two-way communication. We're going to read from John 15, 5. I am the vine, or the branch. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he will bear much fruit. A 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Just a few years ago was an important year for my walk with the Lord. Gus Karupas, who's actually providing our meals. Can we give it up for Gus here? <clears throat> Gus took a proven plan with our food and made it better. And I'm grateful for it. And it's a lot of work uh, to go find the food, set up the coordination, actually picking it up and bringing it here and setting it up. So Gus and I, about five years ago, teamed up to start a challenge group, just the two of us. And we met once a week at the crack of dawn at a Starbucks. And just a, a number of weeks later, both John Sloan and Dwayne Valencia joined us. We took on a, a project to read a book. And we picked a book by Larry Richards called Be a Man. There's only two books I've read where the first line's just a, a killer line. And this is one of them. And I don't even have to look at it. I can tell you what the first line says. You are going to die. And then it goes into unfolding over those chapters the 30 different checkpoints for us to bring into our lives about being a man, living for Christ, standing up for what's right. But my biggest takeaway from the book in Revelation was learning that I am God's beloved son and that he loves me no matter what. In Isaiah 43, 4, God says, You are precious in my eyes. You are honored, and I love you. Brothers, we are God's beloved son. Turn to your neighbor to your right. Say, hey, you're God's beloved son. Turn to your neighbor on your left. Here's a new one. Here's a new one, so pay attention. The one on the left, you're going to say, I am God's beloved son. That's right. Get back to you. But just don't forget, you are God's beloved son. God wants a relationship with us, brothers. The father and son want to engage us in conversation. They want to speak to us, and they want to, us to speak freely and openly to them. As you share your life with them, your struggles, your successes, your praises, you come to know better both God and yourself. Jesus says in John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Brothers, God doesn't make junk. God has created each of us to be drawn to Him because we are truly incomplete without Him. In Psalm 139, King David writes, Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I know that full well. We need to know that we are God's beloved sons. How do we pray? Well, like anything else in life, we've got to show up. Making time is the first requirement of a daily prayer life. To showing up. Make an appointment and keep it. Just like any other appointment, daily prayer should be among our chief commitments. The key for me was to make a commitment to show up, to purpose to set my alarm earlier, and to sit down in a quiet, still place. This was the only way for me to make the time for a consistent appointment with God. 
Find a place where you have privacy and can give the Lord your exclusive attention. In Matthew 6, verse 6, it reads, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. I was just impressed when they wrote that, article, that uh, passage in the Scripture that they had a door to close. A place to go call a quiet place. And we all can find a quiet place sometime in that 24-hour cycle and a place in our homes. Mine actually happens to be a chair that my kids call the daddy chair. And so if I walk in the room, they respectfully jump out of it, with the exception of one, I'm still training them. <laughs> and I have six, so I've had a lot of training experience. But not because I asked them to, but because they gave me the chair. And that's my spot where I sit each morning. While the manner or content of your prayer may vary, the following elements may be included. Let's see if I got this here. Express your love, honor, and praise, and thanks to God. Jesus says in Matthew 9, this is how you should pray. And he actually taught us a whole prayer that we, many of us have memorized. But the opening part of that prayer is a great opening for every prayer. I went past it, didn't I? There you go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Offer up your day and all that you may be doing. Repent of any sin. Matthew 6, 12 reads, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Listen to God and reflect on His Word in Scripture. His Word in your circumstances. His Word spoken to you through others. His Word in the stillness of your heart. Seek His will in all that you do for His glory. Bring Him your needs and concerns. In Philippians 4.6, it reads, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Have confidence that your prayers are heard. Jesus tells us to persist in pursuing God. People often give up after a few half-hearted efforts and conclude that God cannot be found, or that he doesn't answer prayer. I'm going to read the passage out of Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. Amen. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? In 2000, the beginning of this new millennial that we have, a good friend and business mentor gave me this one-year Bible. 
And uh, this one in your Bible has an Old Testament passage, a New Testament passage, a passage from Psalms, and a passage from Proverbs for every day. And it goes through the cycle with Proverbs more frequently, but you end up getting through the Old Testament and the New Testament in a year's time. I can tell you this, this exact Bible here, and just carving out random prayer time before I had a real appointment with God, opened my eyes. I would have to catch up two or three days at times because I wasn't consistent. But it gave me an incentive to draw closer to God. Back in 2007, in that closer relationship with God, He spoke clearly, very clearly to me. He said, I want more. And to be honest with you, He'd said that quite a bit before. But what He made abundantly clear was, I want it now, not later. Which was my response in the past. So I don't know if you remember the 1980 presidential election. Anybody remember who won that year? Okay, so if, you, if it was my first year, I could vote. And uh, I remember the ads. The time is now in America. And I'm not going to sing it for you, but the time is now. So I remember that theme. The time is now, brothers, for each of us today. Long story short... Back in 2007, when God said, I want more and I want it now, he brought Jim Fowdy and myself together to team up for God here in Palm Desert. And he allowed the two of us to serve him in a manner we hadn't served him before. We had just met at Starbucks on Varner Road off of Washington and formulated with the grace of God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit a plan to start a chapter of Christians in Commerce here in the desert. Over the years, I have gone on a variety of retreats, but it wasn't until that year that I went to what I call my all-in retreat. It was my first challenge weekend, and I went over to Orange County for it. My group leader was Greg Akins, and many of you know Greg Akins. He's come to about half of our challenge weekends here in the desert. And Greg was my small group leader. He's also written a number of articles on the appointment with God, so you can tell the appointment with God topic was important to him. Greg really challenged me with my appointment with God because I didn't have a consistent one. And this is just what I needed. A kick in the butt to really start something. Greg shared some simple, specific ideas that have become the main frame of my time with our Lord and Savior. One was to keep it simple. And set up a time each day that really works. How long? Ten minutes. He said, just start with ten minutes. So if you don't have a prayer life every day, start with ten minutes every day. You'll be amazed what God does with that ten minutes. Find that place. We talked about a place that was, a, I call it the, the DFZ, the distraction-free zone. Some place that either by the time of day or the location removes distractions. And anybody who has a smartphone needs to beware of the distractions a smartphone can bring even to your appointment with God. Greg also gave the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. And he defined ACTS, A standing for adoration, C for contrition, having a contrite heart, T for thanksgiving, S for supplication, Asking God for the things that we need or the people in our lives need. Greg said, also, be sure to always include God's Word. I've learned over time that being still in my quiet time is also very vital. And one of my favorite authors, Matthew Kelly, calls it being still in the classroom of silence. And in that classroom of silence, God has a great opportunity to speak to us. And the fourth thing that Greg shared was to journal what God was sharing with you. And the power of the journal is you can boil down your quiet time, your appointment with God into the takeaway for you. It can be just one sentence. 
It can be several things that God unfolded, including scripture. I like to actually do Acts, A-C-T-S, in my brief one page devoted in my journal. So my best appointments with God include following that the adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. Scripture, the Word. Even though I had read the Bible back in 2000, and I made it through the whole Bible by doing a little bit of cramming on certain days to catch up, I can tell you what's really amazed me is how infinitely true God's Word is. Anybody agree with that? Yeah. Infinitely true God's Word is. When God speaks, things change. Everything around you, all of creation, exists because God spoke it into existence. That gives me chills down my spine to think that God created everything by speaking out. God's Word is like any other word. It is alive. It's alive today as it was the day it was penned. In John 6, Jesus says, The words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. They are not mere words. They are alive. These are not mere words. God is alive. God's word generates life. Here's a list of things that God's Word does. You won't be able to write this fast, so try and keep up. God's Word generates life. It creates faith. It produces change. It frightens the devil. It causes miracles. It heals, hurts, and builds character. God's Word transforms circumstances. It imparts joy. It overcomes adversity. It defeats temptation. It infuses hope. God's word releases power. It cleanses our minds. It brings things into being. It guarantees our future forever. You see, as believers in Jesus Christ, we cannot live, wa live without the word of God. We should never take it for granted, and all of us should consider God's word as essential to our life as food is. God's word is a sp the spiritual nourishment that we need to fulfill our purpose in God's plan for our life. Brothers, come to the feast. Come to the feast in your prayer time, in your appointment with God, by wrapping your arms and your time around the, His holy word. Being still in the classroom of silence. <clears throat> I live in a neighborhood. It's a gated community. A few of you know where it's at if I say La Haciendas. Uh, in fact, one of you worked for a company who actually manages La Haciendas. The other two of you know it by real estate or you paved it. <coughs> right there in the back, Chris. Chris did the resurfacing there last year. In the Haciendas, we have like six Indio police officers, we have two border patrols, a couple highway patrols, and at least one or two sheriff's deputies. So they call it Copville. So my neighbors call it Copville. Well, you can imagine that there's more than one canine unit. That's the police officer that gets to take his German Shepherd home. Well, not long ago, uh, they changed their routine with the German Shepherd, and he was barking. Guess what time he was barking? During prayer time. And so I'm like, that is just annoying. And the Lord said, just like a rooster is annoying. And I was convicted that morning. Because the Friday or Thursday before, I met with a guy who was in the back of the room here. His name is Blaine Weiss. Met with Blaine for the first time. And Blaine had this cool looking card. It's different than this one because he's up, he gave me an upgraded one today. But Blaine had a scripture verse on that card. And when he gave me that scripture verse, I kind of said, cool. And I said something about the scripture verse. And Blaine asked me a question. Blaine goes, are you a Christian? 
Guess what I did? No, I fumbled, guys. I fumbled. I had one of my colleagues and my boss present, and I don't know why I fumbled. I'm the one that brought up the conversation to begin with, but I fumbled. And so I kind of recovered, and the, the dead silence got picked up by parts of the conversation. But on Monday, the next morning, actually the next morning, which was Saturday morning, that dog bark, the rooster crow, I was convicted for denying Christ in the presence of Blaine, Jimmy, and Ed. And the Lord said, you denied me. You love me, but you denied me. So the next business day, which was Monday, Blaine got a call from me. He was my first call. And I said, Blaine, I, just, I have to ask your forgiveness. And Blaine's back here in the back of the room there with the red shirt. Wave your hand there, Blaine. There you go. Put your hand up, Blaine. Steve, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm messing it up here. Anyway, that, that message was, please forgive me because I denied Christ in our conversation. I had two more conversations to have in seeking forgiveness. The classroom of silence is where God spoke to me. Anybody remember the 1970s? Okay, got a few of you here. <clears throat> CB radios were big and popular back then. And uh, everybody wanted to have them, not only in the trucks, the semi-trucks that traveled the roadways, but even cars started getting them. They're putting them in their cars and their pickup trucks, and so everybody could talk to each other. So it was kind of a popular fad thing back in the 70s. And you'd say, hey, there's a Smokey coming up here, uh, on, up, up a mile ahead on the right-hand side. And, and uh, say other, other cool things, like uh, where, where are you traveling to, and talk. But to check to see, to check to see if anybody was listening, they would say, got your ears on. Got your ears on. Brothers, we have to be tuned in. We have to have our ears on during that quiet time. The journal, I wanted to just sh share with you my first journal. And I, and I thumbed through it when I was practicing my talk with the guys. And it starts out on January 21st, 2008. And I just started with the simple adoration in Acts. God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. My best days begin with my quiet time with God. My best days even end in prayer. Why should we keep our appointment with God? Staying on track is where the rubber meets the road. Have any of you ever missed an appointment, ever? Yes. Dentist appointments included? If you don't show up, what do you do? You make a new appointment. Just make a new appointment. Reschedule the appointment. Refresh your commitment and restart. Brothers, we are beloved sons of God and He created do-overs just for us. If we get off track and lose traction in our appointment with God, take your do-over and get back on track. Brothers, your daily appointment with God is where the rubber meets the road. Let's read the prayer together on page 16. And I'm going to have you read it because my journal is not with me. Father, there is no life apart from you. Make me one with Jesus, one with you. Glory.